It is officially September, which is my favorite time of year. And just like that, if you are a new PhD student, you are probably about to begin a program of study that's three years, four years, five years in the next couple of weeks. And I'm really excited for you. It's such an exciting time where you're going to be learning so much and you'll be discovering and learning new things every single day. So in today's video, I want to talk about 20 things that I think you should know before you begin a PhD, which will help you not only become the, a better academic overall, but it'll also help you consider things that will make your life slightly easier in the future when you begin thesis writing or when you think about um, presenting at conferences etc so if you want to hear those 20 things then keep on watching understand your research area so as soon as you start in your research group you will get a list of papers that your supervisor has given you that are papers that you should read to understand your topic start from those and read around the subjects just spend as much time as possible in these early days for the next sort of six months not worrying much about the experiments or your research or your methods but just trying to understand your research area who is involved who are the key players and what are the new papers that have been published in the last couple of months. Set really clear goals. It's so important from the beginning to determine how long you want to take uh, for certain things and certain timelines. Um, and these are, I mean, whilst timelines and goals do change so much during PhD program, if you have some sort of idea of when you want to kind of start, finish, do these experiments, write up, um, do your upgrade, etc. All of these things mean that you will have some sort of goal and some sort of like plan to get there. Think not only about your short term plan for the next sort of couple of years, but also your long term plan. Where do you see yourself in 10 years time and how are the, the choices and the kind of things that you do today going to impact that? Try to establish a routine as soon as possible. So as soon as you start um, in your group, try to think about kind of what time you want to come in, what time you want to leave, when you want to have lunch, and try to think about a routine that works for you as early as possible. So in the early days, of course, you'll be all over the place with meetings with people and reading and, and thinking about your research and going to conferences. And that's going to be quite, quite messy in the beginning, quite chaotic in that sense. But as soon as possible, as soon as you can, try to get into a routine where you think about your daily schedule so you'll do a bit of reading every single day you'll be do a bit of writing maybe you'll do a little bit of research you'll have a meeting maybe once a week with your lab group or your research group and try to think about what that weekly routine looks like because the sooner you have that um, kind of set up the more smooth and the less sort of daunting it seems um, also consider sort of what time you want to come in every day if you are someone that works in the lab and you have to come in um, and do experiments within the lab then think about what time you want to come in. Try to work around um, everybody else. So if everyone else comes in at 10, I would usually try to come in at nine. So I get an hour of quiet time where there's no one else around. And having that as a routine means that that is sort of what you expect of yourself. And it just helps have that um, kind of self uh, accountability because no one else is going to tell you what to do. Set up a timeline for your supervisor in terms of how often you are going to meet him or her. So think about like how often it makes sense to speak to them. Dep this all depends on your topic. If you're someone um, who is in the biological sciences, you most likely will see them almost every single day. But have a timeline when you want to actually sit with them and have a proper meeting to discuss uh, what you've done in the past week or any challenges that is coming up. So for me, it was once a week, I would have a sit down meeting with my supervisor and we had that determined quite early on. But like I said, we were speaking every single day. So if I had a little issue, I could just kind of mention it to him as I saw him in the lab. But in terms of like our project and our research sort of progress, that would be a sit down meeting. So have that in your calendar from the beginning. Try to network as much as possible. So looking around for what conferences are going on and um, what other departments in your university, there are that kind of overlap. So even if you're in a specific department, another one may have a conference or a seminar or some sort of talks that you of course are invited to because you're a student at that university. But it just means that you're networking and you're also learning more about your wider research area and it just gets you out of your like out of your lab or out of your office as well. Try to join some research groups. Now these could be groups like um, like a bit like a book club but a journal club. There are so many of those that go on and most of them are not really 
advertise outwardly or publicly so it's kind of just like you know when you speak to someone and they say oh I'm going to um, I'm going to a meeting right now I'm going to a journal club then you can say oh I, like what is it can you tell me more can I join and you kind of end up finding a nice network where you'll meet people who are at a slightly advanced stage to you so these may, might be postdocs these might be third year PhD students and the great thing about that is if you're just starting off you don't know what the future holds. So you're speaking to these people and they're saying, oh, you know, I'm finishing my PhD, I'm going into uh, this particular research area or I'm going into this industry. And you can have that connection and you never know why or how that could be helpful to you in the future. Try to learn the tools and the skills that you need as early as possible. Um, and this is something that's really important because it will really determine how quickly you're able to get some results, some initial results anyway. So if you know that you are going to be using the microscope or if you know that you're going to be doing a certain um, lab technique or a certain research technique, then try your best to read around the subject, look or ask someone, can I shadow you? Or, you know, can I take a look at your methods and your results? And try to understand what those methods and results and, and kind of how they've got that. Like, what does that actually mean? Because the earlier you can understand them, the earlier you can apply that to your own research as well. Now, this is a big one. And if you know me and you've watched this channel for any amount of time, you'll know how big I am on organization. The earlier you are organized and you kind of kind of have that system, the better. There's a video a few videos ago, I would say, um, about keeping a good lab book and keeping a nice, tidy, organized lab book. I would highly recommend you go and watch that if you're doing a PhD in the sciences um, or a PhD where you have a lab book, because it really means that the earlier you get this done, the quicker you're able to firstly just have a system that works. And then at the end, at the end of the three, four, five years, you're not scrambling trying to find what methods you did, what techniques you used, the quantities, where things are. It just all makes sense and it's been recorded from the beginning. And also use things like note-taking apps. A lot of these apps were not really existent when I was doing my PhD just five years ago. Like it wasn't that long ago that things like Notion and um, Evernote and all these like AI apps, they didn't exist. Um, so, and they weren't that popular. So it's really important that now you have these tools available to you, when you where you can bookmark research papers and you can kind of like keep on top of everything that you actually find a system that works and that you can just keep on using for your whole PhD. Writing early. Now this is another big one. If you've attended any of my masterclasses or you listen to me talk for any amount of time, I will always say this. Start writing as early as possible. If you're, you know, you're just starting your PhD, of course you can't write anything just yet. But in a couple of months, you'd have done some methods, you would have done some analysis maybe, you might have done some reading, and those are all parts of what could go into your final thesis, especially the methods. Um, that's not going to change, right? Because you've already done it. So if you can start writing things up and start writing it in a way that can be publishable, like within your thesis or in a paper, it will just make the whole process are so much easier. Um, if you're in the UK, we have to do an upgrade, um, which takes you from an MPhil to a PhD. Then you have to write a mini thesis, like a small report. So if you can start kind of adding information into that and start thinking about what that structure might look like, it will make your life so much easier when you come to write your thesis. Try to identify some gaps in the literature that your research could um, target. Now, of course, if you've started a PhD program, there is a gap that you're already targeting. But as you do your reading, you might pick up some other gaps or some other research areas that you might be interested in kind of poking into. And these could be subtopics. Now, let's consider timelines. When your supervisor advertised for that PhD that you're currently starting this year, it probably was last year, right? Last year or maybe earlier this year. So since then, so much would have changed. So many things would have been published, depending on what area, but from a lot of areas, um, especially within biological sciences, there would be new research papers, new findings, and new preliminary results. And um, from a year ago, you know, so much would have changed. So yes, you have this project that you are, you know, of course going to be um, kind of focusing on, but if you're able to look and read around your research and try to find other areas that you might think, hmm, this could be an interesting subsection I could look into, another research objective that I could focus on, then that's definitely a good idea. Next one is a big one, um, and this is to consider any ethical considerations um, and try to do them as early as possible. They take time. Um, if you have spent any amount of time trying to apply for ethical approval, especially if you're working with like animals and animal testing, things like that, 
then you're going to need months potentially to get some um, acts, just to even begin the process of ethical approval. So it's really important if you have determined that, yes, this is the method and the approach that I'm taking to try to get that approval as soon as possible so you're able to start with your research. Because I've seen it happen where, you know, it's been a year down the line, two years down the line, and ethical approval hasn't been granted yet. And you've only got a couple months left to complete your PhD, actually write some, you know, actually write <laughs> up some results. So trying to get that done as early as possible is my advice. Next one is a great one, staying healthy. Um, and this, I, I'm saying it in this way because as a PhD student, you are going to be thrown all over the place, like literally your personal life, your, your career, your PhD, like the research and then all the, all the research um, chaos, like all of it is going to take a massive toll on you. So it's really important to try and have a healthy work-life balance, PhD life balance. And I think the way that I did it was I kind of had this like self-inflicted rule that I told myself, on the weekends you do no work. And I know, I know, shock horror, but you can do it, you really can do it. You can say to yourself, Monday to Friday, I will put my, my all into it. I'll be in the lab at 8 a.m., 9 a.m. I'll go, you know, I'll leave at 6 p.m. I will read papers in the evening, like I'll go hard between Monday to Friday. On Saturday and Sunday, I, I have no business in the lab or I have no business touching my PhD research. And that was kind of my approach. And that worked really well because it meant that I was able to have a social life. I was able to relax on the weekend. Of course, if you have deadlines, when I had um, my upgrade, of course, I would spend a couple weeks, weekends, like working on it. If I have some results that I need to kind of chase up and I'm not able to get them done between Monday and Friday, of course, some weekends I had to sacrifice. But of like the three years, I probably worked a maximum of 10 weekends of like three years. So it really is possible where you are able to kind of give yourself these boundaries and you stick to it. Trust me, you will thank yourself later. There's no one that, like I didn't get any less of a PhD because I didn't do work on Saturday and Sunday, you know, it doesn't work like that. Next one is to seek help whenever you need it and to know that help is available to you. If you're a PhD student, you are probably a high achiever. So you're probably someone that has done everything by themselves. So, you know, try to change that mentality and tell yourself, look, I am a researcher now. I'm an academic. I'm someone who it's not about feeling weak or looking weak we're all here trying to answer a research question and you know kind of engage in this um, life of an academic so asking questions and asking for help is really really key and it's actually part of the process okay this is another one um, working is you can work of course you can make some money on the side and there's loads of different ways of doing that but one of the things that you can do that can help both your CV and of course making some money is trying to find some teaching opportunities within your university. So I remember that when I was in my PhD, I didn't do it myself, but there were some um, PhD students who were doing some teaching for the undergrads and for the master's students. So if you can inquire about that and try to find that opportunity, that would be great. There are other ways that you can kind of get some uh, work experience slash money. For example, I run a company called The Page Doctor. We recruit PhD students only who do proofreading and feedback for undergrad students. Um, so this is something that you could also do. I'll leave the link for like our recruitment down below, but you can make a considerable amount of money, um, like a full salary per month from just doing something like that. Get familiar with the university and its resources. Um, one thing about PhD students is that we are so tied into, like, we're just, you know, in our labs, in our offices, and we don't really go around our, our university campus the way that undergraduates do. We're not that involved in it. So, I mean, I feel like I didn't really go to the library much at my university during my PhD as much as I did during my undergrad. But towards the end, I started to do it and I really regretted not doing it sooner. So get familiar with the university, know where everything is, um, know where the workspaces are, where you can kind of grab your laptop and do a bit of writing outside of your office or outside of your workspace. It's really like, you know, it helps change your environment and also it just means that you feel like you're part of a university. Learn time management skills. Pointing my finger because you need to learn how to manage your time correctly because there's no one that's going to manage it for you as a PhD student. And you can very easily end up two years down, two years down the line, yes you can, two years down the line without having actually gotten any solid research or without actually having like a good plan or any sort of anything really, it can just fly by with you doing reading. So have a good solid plan and 
have good time management skills. If you've given yourself a morning to do something, do it in that morning, don't procrastinate. But if you're someone who is finding it hard and you need more support, then you can of course speak, speak to your supervisor. Find someone in your lab, like an accountability partner who you can work alongside with to kind of check in with your goals. But time management as a PhD student is so crucial if you want to finish your PhD on time. Explore collaborations and funding opportunities um, aside from your actual PhD funding. So one of the things I was looking at during my PhD and I actually ended up doing was going abroad for a few months to work with some collaborators. And in order to do that, I applied for some funding, which was great because it meant that I was able to get paid for the flights, um, some money for like tourism and um, obviously my, my, my stay and accommodation and food, like daily food. So I got like a nice lump sum of money, which meant that I was able to, you know, enjoy my stay in Montreal where I was in Canada, but also like have a good time. So I went to New York and that was like all paid for. So there are opportunities within your PhD um, program to be able to go and do some more work with collaborators abroad. So do look out for them and apply for them because not many people do. So if you apply for them, you actually have a really strong chance even by just applying. And last but not least is don't dim your fire or dim your light. Don't dim your lights because of the challenges. Like don't allow the challenges to dim your lights. And I say this because I think, you know, we enter, you start your PhD, you're like, oh, I want to do a PhD. I want to be an academic. I want to be a researcher. I love research. I love science. I love like this topic. And then you start your PhD and it just like your motivation and like your excite that excitement, that like beautiful excitement you have in the beginning, it just goes whoop, like that. And I think a lot of it is because of all the challenges and because of the all the like bureaucracy and all of the like politics and like paperwork and everything that comes with the PhD. But stay curious, stay excited, don't allow like external factors to ruin the experience for you. It's not an easy time, you're going to struggle, but you're going to struggle in a way that you know you're able to manage and hopefully <laughs> hopefully able to manage and hopefully you'll come out of it and you'll be a much better academic and a much better person in general if you enjoyed this video don't forget to leave me a thumbs up and if you are starting a phd in the next this month um congratulations and also good luck you'll be absolutely fine there are so many like learning points and learning times during a PhD that just makes it so enjoyable and it's something that I would never regret like embarking on no matter how difficult it was at times so good luck leave me a comment down below if you are starting a PhD I really want to know what you're doing what are you doing and what university are you going to I'd love to know um but yeah don't forget to subscribe to my channel see you soon bye